And now we're going to give an even bigger, even warmer round of applause for Alex and Moritz, who's going to talk about getting rid of nuclear weapons. <laughs> give it up, louder. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Um, thanks, everyone, for uh, joining us. Uh, I'm Alex, and this is Moritz. And as uh, he just said, this is a talk about uh, nuclear weapons. Uh, both Moritz and I, and also our uh, colleagues back in Princeton, um, spent most of our time trying to get rid of them. Uh, but so far, uh, we haven't made much progress, especially lately. Uh, and 2017 was uh, a particularly difficult uh, years. Uh, but in this business, uh, you're in for the long haul. Uh, you have to be persistent, and you want to be ready uh, when there are new opportunities for um, confidence building, arms control, and, uh, and nuclear disarmament initiatives. Now, um, for this talk, uh, what's relevant is that any new uh, initiative toward uh, further uh, reductions in the nuclear arsenals will have to rely on robust verification uh, mechanisms. And as you will hopefully see today, uh, verif verification uh, will have to rely on trusted uh, radiation measurements. Um, after 25 years of R&D uh, in this area, no winning technology has, has emerged. And ultimately, it boils down to a lack of trust in the uh, electronics that is being used uh, for these applications. Uh, so Moritz and I thought, well, uh, perhaps vintage computing platforms uh, may offer a, a, a new answer to, uh, um, uh, to provide an, uh, an answer to, uh, to this challenge. And uh, so we brought some gear and uh, hopefully we'll um, demo it in, in a couple of minutes. Um, so, but before I get to this, uh, let me just briefly uh, summarize uh, where we are today with regard uh, to nuclear weapons. Um, there, are, remain, uh, there still remain about 15,000 nuclear weapons uh, today. Um, more than 90% of them are owned by uh, the US uh, and Russia. And then uh, you see you know, seven other nuclear weapon states uh, in the world. Unfortunately, these numbers actually haven't come down by much over the last uh, 15 or 20 years or so. And you know, by any meaning from standard, it's, you know, it's, a, it's a, a gigantic number. Uh, New this year was um, the North Korean uh, last, uh, latest test uh, in September, uh, where uh, North Korea for the very first time uh, conducted a, a test, a large nuclear weapons test, 250,000 tons of uh, TNT uh, equivalent. Uh, and we believe it, this was a, a two-stage thermonuclear weapon, and it's significant in many ways. Um, uh, because North Korea only tested, you know, five or six nuclear weapons before that, and, and it certainly now has a, a, a credible nuclear uh, capability and also the, um, the, the means to deliver, uh, you know, this weapon. We call it the peanut here. You can see this typical shape for a two-stage weapon uh, with a primary and a secondary. Uh, now, in the interest of time, uh, I will not uh, walk you through the uh, global consequences of a... Uh, a, a nuclear war, uh, even a limited one, uh, and they are pretty, you know, bad as you might uh, imagine. Um, and personally, I believe, you know, even a single nuclear explosion uh, in a major uh, city um, would, you know, in, in many ways be the end of the world as we kind of um, uh, know it and, and not in a, in a good way. Obviously, with a 200 kiloton uh, explosion, you could wipe out an entire city uh, in, an, in an instant. Um, now, lately there has been, uh, you know, quite some, uh, you know, loose talk about, you know, using nuclear weapons uh, again. We haven't seen this in, you know, 20, 30 years or so. Um, there is talk in Washington about a preventive um, nuclear war against North Korea, um, and that is, you know, uh, disturbing. And I'm afraid there will be, you know, more of this uh, in in 2018. And this blo this uh, tweet here kind of summarizes. Uh, the situation quite well. You can't lose the 2020 election if there is no uh, 2020. Um, however, there has also been some positive developments uh, uh, this year. Uh, early in the summer, uh, 122 uh, nations at the UN uh, in New York uh, negotiated a nuclear weapons ban uh, treaty. 
um, which places nuclear weapons for the very first time in the same category as biological weapons, chemical weapons, uh, cluster munitions, and, and landmines. Um, for obvious reasons, the weapon states uh, did not participate in these uh, negotiations, but, you know, the idea is they will, you know, join uh, along the way. Um, since we're here in Germany, and I'm, you know, a citizen of Germany, just as Moritz, uh, it's worth mentioning that Germany, too, uh, voted against uh, the resolution uh, in, in 2016 to start uh, negotiations on, on such a treaty. Uh, I don't want to be, you know, dwell on this uh, too much. I personally believe this is, is a mistake. Uh, it would be uh, the right thing to do uh, for Germany to join this treaty, and it wouldn't be particularly diff uh, difficult for, for Germany to do so. And, you know, just to uh, close on this, and you know, just uh, earlier this month, and this is, you know, it is a big deal, uh, ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, uh, received the Nobel Peace Prize uh, just for this, uh, for this reason, to facilitate the negotiations of, of this treaty. And you can see some of the key folks who've been involved and kind of made this uh, uh, treaty possible. So this is uh, really uh, one of the highlights of, of this year. Now, but, you know, coming back to the purpose or the topic of this talk. So what is to be uh, verified? I already mentioned it's, uh, it's, it's going to be critical to have verification uh, mechanism in place. It's particularly important also for the ban uh, treaty where you try to verify you know, the number zero. Uh, and the United States, for example, has actually made the point that uh, the ban treaty cannot be verified. And for this reason, it should be you know, boycotted, uh, which is nonsense, of course. But you, you get the idea. People do take the verification question uh, very seriously. Um, now, to kind of highlight or illustrate uh, what it involves, uh, we have this cartoon here of a fictional nuclear weapon state. Uh, has a bunch of you know, nuclear facilities. Uh, some of them are civilian, um, and you may find them in other countries too, enrichment plants, reactors, and so on. But some of them are military, uh, and they're highlighted uh, here in blue. And you know, the difference, the main difference between a weapon state and a non-weapon state is that the weapon state you know, has nuclear weapons, and they move around uh, the weapons complex, right? Um, so what they're trying to do is um, confirm certain constraints uh, on, these, on these weapons, limits on the number, you know, and the number again could be zero. Uh, and there are important challenges uh, that you have to resolve when you, you know, when you try to verify such a treaty, and I, I highlight them here on this, um, on this cartoon. We could give uh, talks about any one of them. Um, but today we want to talk about one specific one that's typically considered uh, one of the, maybe the most uh, difficult one to, um, to uh, address, um, which is confirming the authenticity of a nuclear weapon. So in a sense, the scenario is, you know, the, your counterpart, the Russians, the Americans, whoever shows up and says, look, uh, we have 100 nuclear weapons here, we want to can dismantle them, and we want to get credit for, the, for this, right? Uh, we want to kind of have these reductions uh, on the books, and how do you make sure uh, that whatever they present to you is actually a nuclear weapon or a bunch of nuclear weapons? That's the challenge, and that's what we're trying to uh, solve today with uh, vintage verification. So, so how do you do that? Um, so the first thing we need to know, and it's really the only thing we need to know, is uh, that nuclear weapons, any nuclear weapon contains fissile material, nuclear explosive material. Um, and, you know, I put uh, the numbers here on, uh, on the screen. Typically, three to four kilograms of plutonium, for example, uh, is um, enough, or you, you could expect this in a nuclear weapon. And that, that's about the amount of plutonium you would have in, in a nuclear warhead. I was told this is aluminum. Um, <laughs> And, you know, and again, anything else really doesn't matter uh, too much for our purposes. The key is it's plutonium or highly enriched uranium. Both of them are radioactive, and we can use this to uh, detect them from a distance. Um, now, the issue is, uh, so they have unique radiation signatures, uh, uh, but they are highly sensitive and they cannot be revealed uh, to inspectors. The only exception is really the one you see here on on the screen, uh, this is a bunch of U.S. scientists, uh, actually some of our colleagues um, in Princeton involved, uh, who went uh, to the Black Sea in 1989 and, and, and made a measurement on a Soviet, at the time, nuclear weapon, and published the, uh, the spectrum in, uh, in Science Magazine. And uh, here you go. 
uh, it turns out you can actually learn quite a lot from this uh, spectrum. So uh, in the aftermath of this uh, exercise, uh, weapon states concluded, well, this, uh, we cannot really do this anymore. This was kind of a bad uh, call to go this way. Uh, so, in, so then a couple of new concepts were uh, developed and we'll implement it. we've implemented one of them in this, in this, uh, in this um, you know, box over there. Uh, the first one is, okay, I can't possibly show you the spectrum that you can, just saw, so we have to kind of do it somewhat differently. The first idea they came up with is the attribute approach. You said, okay, you cannot look at this weapon or at this component, it's in a container, uh, but we can agree on certain attributes. Uh, so you sit down with the Russians and say, well, you know, we have plutonium, you have plutonium. That's an attribute, and both uh, sides would agree, okay, yes, we can, you can confirm that there's plutonium in this container. That's one attribute. Maybe there's a certain minimum mass. It has to be more than one kilogram. And we can do this also with radiation detection measurements, more than one kilogram. Certain isotopics, uh, even the geometry or the size or the mass, you can uh, detect with uh, radiation detection equipment. So you make a list of attributes. One approach, we don't really like it particularly much because it's, um, it's obvious how you would defeat it. Uh, because, you know, if the, if the threshold is set at one kilo, I just need to present, you know, 1.1 kilos, it, it will always pass uh, the test. Um, that's one way to do it. Uh, and the second one is the one we are using here for this exercise or this experiment, is the so-called template approach. You do um, acquire one radiation spectrum from what we call a golden warhead, reference item. You, um, you store it, perhaps, in some way. Um, and then uh, when, you know, down the road, uh, the other side shows up with a second item, you compare the two signatures against each other. And if they match, you say, okay, I accepted the first one, I will also accept the second one. So that's the template approach, and we'll do this um, later in a, in a moment. So uh, in both cases, you do acquire sensitive information, right? I mean, the, the radiation detector will see everything. Um, so what you need is a third uh, idea, which is called an information barrier, which is really just a, an, a piece of electronic equipment that will do the data analysis and then only display a kind of a red light, green light, you know, pass, fail, go, no go result. Okay, it will not display the actual spectrum. And that's uh, the, the, the main idea of an information barrier. And coming back to, you know, why is this, you know, such a difficult job? Uh, the problem is how can both sides, the inspector and the host team, trust the technology at the same time? Okay, so the, um, the, um, the host is worried that this machine will accidentally release the secrets, right? Through some side channel or so. And the, um, the inspector is worried that the machine is actually not doing anything meaningful and uh, will just display, you know, the result that the host uh, wants to see, right? So this is actually something that a Russian nuclear weapons expert said when he, he or she was invited uh, to a visit at, at a U.S. Uh, weapons lab. You know, you have some machine that, you know, does something, I have no way of knowing that this is actually a genuine measurement. So that's essentially where we are today with, uh, you know, the, uh, the state of the technology. Uh, let me just, you know, wrap up here quickly before we move into the demo part. You know, why are they so hard? I already summarized some of this. Um, so first is, and it's very unusual for an experimental physicist or so, that you actually don't know what you're looking at, except for the fact that, you know, it's plutonium or so. Um, so you cannot reveal or you do not want to reveal about what's actually in the box. Um, some information may be shared in advance, but you certainly don't want to learn anything else during the inspection. The second part is, uh, you know, we're talking US, Russia, you know, China, uh, and the rest of them. Um, the, your adversary has de facto infinite resources, okay? And the adversary may be, you know, quite motivated to actually uh, defeat or deceive uh, your, your system. And just as one data point, uh, the U.S. is currently um, or refurbishing one U.S. nuclear weapon, the B-61 uh, Mod 12, uh, refurbishing that weapon costs more than $30 million. One weapon, $30 million, which is more uh, than the weight of gold of that bomb. Um, so a government is willing to pay $30 million to refurbish one weapon. You might imagine how, many, how much resources it may throw at you know, a system that might actually you know, pass fake nuclear weapons uh, uh, as, as genuine. And then finally, 
And that's, you know, for this community in particular, the, the most uh, difficult one or, you know, ironic one. The host uh, has last ownership of the inspection system before the measurement. So they walk away and, you know, you don't know what they're doing with it. Uh, and the inspector never again has access to the system after the measurement uh, is complete. Uh, because there may be some form of, you know, uh, classified information left in the system. Uh, so that's, is, you know, essentially why uh, these inspections are so hard and which is why we thought, you know, can we offer an alternative with, uh, with vintage technologies. Now it's time for Moritz uh, to proceed. Here you go. So, as we heard, it's hard. And if you look around who build such systems, there actually have been less than 10 built in the world, which is very few for 25 years of development. I'm going to introduce three, and then we're going to start up the, the computer that we have set up there. One is a called Trusted Radiation Identification System, or short TRIS, built in the end of the last millennium by the Sandia National Laboratories. And uh, this is how it looks like. It's based on the template approach, so it measures a sample and then compares this to an item you want to inspect. For this, it uses a simple sodium iodide detector. It's a radiation detector that detects gamma rays. It's, it's very rough in the spectrum that it generates, but it's good enough for the, the purpose. It runs from a 12-volt battery, and it has something that's called a trusted processor in this metal enclosure. There's actually two processors and some more hardware that's installed in there. And it doesn't have a green light, but it has a display and a keypad. So you control it by this keypad and you display the result on the display. And these small little weird looking things on the left of the picture, the so-called I buttons. And one of them is actually used to store the template. They're basically just you know, small memory things you can plug into this trusted processor. So what we like about the TRIS system is it's very simple in its detector uh, setup. It's passive and it uses this low resolution measurement, so you don't generate too much information that might then be given to someone you don't want to give. And it also uses a strong tempo indicating enclosure, so Sandia National Laboratories actually are, are pretty good in building these things for a variety of purposes. So this is this mat metal box. Inside of this, it's actually divided in two sides by a big metal plate. One side is called the red side, the other side is called the black side and they only communicate through three small holes by optical means, so they're actually completely ele electrically separated. The red side handles the classified data, and the black side uh, deals with the display and the, the keypad you saw. And they also added uh, special temper boards on the sides. You see if someone drilled a hole into this and make eddy current measurements before and uh, after the measurement to see if someone has deal dealt with this metal enclosure. And uh, the last thing we like, probably not the last, but the last on this slide, is it's, it's actually pretty fast. So you can measure a template or an inspection in 30 to 60 seconds. And uh, then you take the spectrum, condense it down to 60 numbers, and only these 60 numbers are used to compare it um, to another item by a simple statistical test. There are also some things that we don't like. So we don't like that it actually uses very complex hardware. Even if this is only in a 586, an AMD K5 processor inside on a PC-104 form factor board, it still has 4 million transistors that you would need to verify to make sure it actually does what it's supposed to do. It also uses an FPGA for the data analysis, and there's actually two of these uh, processor boards inside, one on the red side, one on the black side. Also, we don't really like that it's, it's a system built only by a nuclear weapon state in the United States, and its, its main focus was to ensure that no information is leaked. But they actually also said that this was their main focus, so they had a hard time kind of proving to the side they wants to inspect that the system actually not just only shows a green light or a good sign on the display when, uh, when it's asked to. There's a second system that's more recent, built actually by a nuclear weapon state, the United Kingdom, and um, a non-nuclear weapon state, Norway. They came together in the UK-Norway initiative for about 10 years, and they did two things. One was they, they simulated uh, disarmament of nuclear weapon as a kind of you know, live action role play. So they actually walked around with warheads and measurement devices, not warheads, with fake warheads and measurement devices, and so, tried to figure out why this is hard. But they also built an information barrier. And this is how it looks like. This is their third iteration. They had two they built before, one by UK and one by Norway. And um, their goal, they had many goals to build this. So they wanted to have a simple device, as simple as possible. They wanted to um, use off-the-shelf hardware. They wanted to have it modular. So you see it's divided 
uh, not only by geometry but also by color into a digital board, an analog board, a low voltage board and a high voltage board. They want also it to operate from battery, so this operates from battery, so it's independent of a power supply. Um, and they wanted it to be very robust um, for use, and they wanted it to be very clear while you're using it. So they came up with these three buttons, and then uh, the middle circles are green LEDs, and the other ones are red LEDs. So there's actually green lights. Um, but they set out to to use the attribute approach. So they, they didn't do the template approach, but they tried to use the attribute approach. And the attributes they picked for this device um, are the presence of plutonium, a material that you can use in a nuclear weapon, and the ratio between two specific isotopes of plutonium, one plutonium-239 and one plutonium-235, uh, 240, sorry. And if this ratio was um, you know, above a certain threshold, they would show a green light. What we like about this is the clear operational procedure. They had this very simple uh, user interface. You think this is you know, not that important, but if you have a nuclear warhead in the room, you want to make sure that everyone knows what's happening and there should be no confusion about anything, basically. They also had comprehensive documentation. You can download schematics, bill of materials, and uh, the software that ran on the machine on, on their website. It took them quite you know, a couple of years, but then it's published now, and we actually learned a lot from this. And last but not least, the most important, this is actually a joint design effort between a nuclear weapon state and a state that does not have access to nuclear weapons. And they were aware of this and um, analyzed also what problems they had doing this. Same here, what we don't like that much. Um, the system is based on the attribute approach, which in general is, is harder because you not only have to make sure that two things are equal, but you actually have to identify things from everything else. And so they use a high purity germanium detector, similarly gamma detector, but um, it gives you a finer spectrum, which they need, but it also requires to be cooled by nitrogen, liquid nitrogen, to be very cold. And it's not easy to do in the field. They also need a very complex algorithm in the box to say, okay, th there's plutonium present or there's no plutonium present. And they have the same problem as before. They, of course, use, the, the, there is no real open uh, chip, but they use the closed chip um, for the data analysis, they limited themselves also to a simple chip, the Admega 2560, an 8-bit microcontroller for data analysis. Um, when we looked at the schematics, we also found this uh, AT Tiny microcontroller on the so-called analog board, and we were first surprised what this was, but they said they use it for timing issues, but just in a place where you wouldn't expect any digital uh, analysis. Though this shows, this was for us the first example to say, okay, you know, there, there might be something going on. Why is there a microcontroller where well, there shouldn't be? And they both have flash that probably could store images, so that might be a problem. The third example uh, we call Information Barrier Experimental, or IBX, something we built, uh, we built two years ago. We mostly built it uh, because it looks good and uh, also because we wanted something to, to learn, uh, kind of a prototype to actually see what problems could we have and uh, as a mean to teach people to how you would use this and how you would build this. It's also a template approach. It can store up to three templates and then measure an item and say, um, you know, it's one of these three templates. And it also uses a sodium iodide crystal, uh, crystal and scintillator as the TRIST system. Uh, this is how it looks like from the inside. We try to make it very transparent and also cheap, it's you know, cheap in, a, in quotation marks, it's less than $1,000. Uh, on the left side, there's a single board computer. On the right side, there's a, a custom-made board. On the right picture, you see when it, when it measures something. And uh, we also, in a sense, ran into the same problem. We, we use a, a complex chip. So we use this board, it's called the Red Pitaya, which is nice because it has this fast analog input we use for, for data acquisition. But you can only do this if you have an, an FPGA, basically, because the 14-bit 125 million samples per second need to be processed fast. And if you have a, a proper processor, and we run a full Linux stack for now, because it was just the simplest thing to do. So then we took a step back, as Alex said, and we said, okay, what, what else can we do? And we, we came up with the idea, okay, let's try if we can actually do the same with, with hardware that is old. And that's called uh, vintage verification. That's the name we came up for it. Why would you do that? You take the best of all worlds and you try to build a trust through simplicity and probably also through, through obsolescence. And we use a simple detector system, again, sodium iodide. Um, it's widely available. It gives you the so low resolution spectrum. And then we use vintage computing platforms. 
We use an Apple II in this case, which is it's, it's relatively old. It has been reverse engineered, even if the specs haven't been published. N not all of them, but it, it has been reverse engineered quite good. So it's quasi open source, that's what I called it. And it's, it's unlikely that someone hit a backdoor or a hidden switch in this system 40 years ago for the case that it might be used for warhead verification today. So we think this is not uh, very likely. And another thing why we want to use this is you would like to use the BYOIB, bring your own information barrier approach, where you know the host country and the inspecting country would go together and shop for hardware, basically either on eBay or go somewhere and pick a device and use this. And uh, as the processor inside of the Apple II, there's the, the 6502, something we also like very much. It still has fewer transistors than there are nuclear weapons in the world. We hope to change this for the nuclear weapons. Uh, it has only 3,510 transistors, runs usually at one megahertz, has 56 instructions. But there's an abundant number of these devices built. So the numbers vary depending on who you ask, but people say there have been billions of these chips actually made. And they have been made from 1975, and they are made more or less until today. And these are five chips that we actually uh, had to, to, to play with. And uh, some of them are also in these arcade machines um, in, in Alex's living room. And you see his kids testing our verification processors, if they work uh, good or bad. And they're also in the Apple II. It's the 40th anniversary this year also of the Apple II. So the computer is older than I am. And uh, that made it a fun project to, to develop uh, radiation measurement uh, cards for this. Um, why would we use that? Uh, why would you use an Apple? If you look at Apple today, you just think, what's, what's the benefit of, uh, of doing something with an Apple? But uh, when this was developed, uh, it was actually, I think, probably the last time that uh, hackability or the ability to extend your system uh, won in the, in the company policy over uh, seamless end-to-end -end user experience. So when they developed this device, their first home computer that actually came in an enclosure, um, the two Steves, Steve Jobs and Steve Wozniak, had a fight about how many extension slots this uh, device should have. Wozniak said it should have eight slots that people could do whatever they like. You know, they could build cards, they could uh, build things, and they could probably verify uh, nuclear warheads at some point. Uh, Jobs said there should only be two, one for a printer and one for a modem, and that's enough. People won't do more with that. So we are happy that uh, Wozniak won. And you can see this on the, on the main board. This is a main board of an, of an Apple IIe, which is kind of a, a slightly more uh, advanced version of the Apple II um, in this case. Forgot the, the year, I think it's from 82. Yes, uh, this is a board from 82. This is the board that's actually on display here on the, on the table. And it has these eight expansion slots. And it also has some uh, you know, standard computer hardware. It has the 6502 processor. And it has a ROM and RAM. So we can start using it without building our own computer. In theory, of course, you could just take the, the 6502 and then take some RAM and some ROM and plug this together and uh, make the same measurement, but that would be a, a step further than just developing cards for, for the Apple II. And with that, I think it's time to, to actually turn it on for the first okay. time. And we'll, I hope it works. We'll see. Um, can you switch the, the camera video? I can see this yet, but anyway, turn it on. The, the floppy disk is not inserted. OK, start with this. All right. The floppy disk was missing. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here we go. So we uh, first we need to uh, ramp the high voltage. Uh, the detector typically uh, needs on the order of a thousand volts, and Moritz is going to walk you through, uh, you know, uh, the details of the boards. So now the high voltage is up, and uh, we can acquire uh, the first template. So uh, we're fortunate. Uh, friends from Bochum uh, brought us a, a small calibration source uh, that we can set in front of the detector, um, so you know we can actually get a signal. Uh, so we acquire the template. And here we go. 
of course, in the, the actual measurement setting, you wouldn't see this spectrum. This is the thing you actually want to have classified, but we thought it's, you know, it's more useful to show to people here that this device is actually acquiring data. So this is a Cobalt 60 source for those of you, um, you know, who, are, who are not in this business. And people like Cobalt 60. I mean, if you like radioactive sources, I guess. Uh, because it has, it has these two peaks that you can see, and it helps you really understand you know, the, uh, the sensitivity or the resolution of, of your detector. Anyway, this is going to count until, uh, to, um, uh, to the 17th count, I guess. Yeah. So we and go back to the, the main screen. If we let this run in the background, we come back to this uh, after a while. Um, probably Alex actually has to you know, push a button on the computer to, to there's acquire. One, there's one issue. The detector has to warm up uh, a little bit. So ideally, we'd have to wait five minutes or so to uh, stabilize the high voltage. So we'll see how we're doing, uh, we'll be doing on the, um, on the verification or the inspection in a few minutes. OK. So what just happened? Uh, just a very quick uh, physics 101. Uh, we had gamma rays coming from this uh, source. That's one type of radiation. And the gamma rays hit a scintillation crystal. Uh, that's something that's this shiny blue thing. So it's basically a material that absorbs this gamma ray from the radiation source. And it emits other photons, but photons that are more like, more like standard light. And it emits about 38,000 photons for a single gamma ray with the energy of 1 MeV. And uh, these, these peaks are 1.2 MeV and 1. Point, I always forget the, the exact number, but you know, a little bit above 1 MeV. So all these photons get emitted in the crystal. And then they hit this photocathode, which sits at the end of the, the crystal. Uh, and they produce electrons. And these electrons then get amplified by something called the photomultiplier tube, which is a tube where the electrons get accelerated from the cathode towards the anode. And on the way, they hit these curved um, surfaces, which are called dynodes. And whenever they hit one of these, they produce more electrons. Uh, and when they end up at the anode, they, they, one electron from the start is 10 million electrons on the anode. So it's a very, very efficient amplifier for small signals. And then the anode is charged with a lot of electrons. But as we saw in the demo, it needs high voltage. And so we, we designed a high voltage board first. Uh, we cheated a little bit on this here. Um, we used this CAEN or CAIN uh, module, which produces the high voltage for us. We give this 12 volts and a set voltage between 0 and 2.6 volts. And from this, it makes proportional uh, 1 kilovolt up to 1.6 kilovolts, or 1,600 volts. And we didn't want to play with this voltages uh, starting to you know, do electronics. Um, so we use this module, but we want to replace this. And we build a very simple digital to analog converter, which you can see in the middle, based on an R2R network. And this gives us this V set, uh, and it raises this over time to protect the scintillator. And then, of course, we had to build a data acquisition board, a board that takes the electrons that, that sit on the anode, uh, feed this into this BNC connector on the left, uh, process it, I will come to that in a second, and then give it to, to an analog to digital converter. We use a 12-bit flash ADC that has, luckily, an 8-bit bus interface, because the 6502 only has 8-bit data interface. And we have some control logic. And we actually also have uh, some LEDs, red, yellow, green, and uh, some blue ones. But we decided for this demo that we would not use them. So in the um, analog uh, part of the board on the left, first you get uh, the signal. It's pre-amplified. It doesn't mean it's amplified, but it's something that sits in front of the amplifier. And it takes the charges and converts them into a voltage pulse by a charge-sensitive op-amp uh, circuit. And you see it's a fast rising pulse, but it, it decays slowly over time. So the next thing we do is differentiate the signal by a differentiating op-amp stage. And so the decay is uh, shorter, but then it gets inverted. So we use an inverting stage. Oops. We use an inverting stage uh, to flip it back up and also use a, a trim pot to adjust the gain. Because depending on, on the build, actually, and the resistors you used, uh, you always have to adjust the signal. So it actually fits in the, the ADC uh, voltage range. Then we do some pulse shaping. Uh, it's to be noticed here that actually the scope shot, this is shots from our oscilloscope, that it's, it takes a much wider time range. Uh, and you see that the rise time of the pulse now is, is slower. And we did this to detect this pulse easier. Instead of fast rising, we now have a relatively slow rising pulse. And then we feed this in the biggest and, and most confusing stage, which is the peak detect and hold area. 
and it also does the ADC timing. And I will go through the, the oscilloscope shot on this uh, in detail. The yellow line is the line of the, actually of the output of number one on the previous slide of the uh, charge collecting op amp stage. The blue line, this is what the peak detect and hold circuit actually gives to the ADC. And you see this is uh, very nice because it rises up to the peak and then it holds the voltage of the peak uh, and gives the ADC time to convert this. And uh, I forgot to mention, of course, uh, that the, the height of the peak is actually proportional to the energy of the gamma ray that we detected earlier. So we hold this voltage for a while. Uh, and then we use the purple, which is a digital signal, produced by a comparator, we, we say, okay, when it raises above a certain level, then we should uh, probably start this conversion. And then we wait a little while um, until the signal is, is flat, and then we emit the green uh, digital signal to the ADC, and say, so, okay, now you can start the conversion. And then if you look far to the, the right of the picture, you see uh, that the signal goes down again. And this is actually the time when the ADC has done the conversion, takes about 10 to 15 microseconds, and the Apple II has read the two words from the ADC and stored them in channel in memory and also increased the total counter that counts the total number of events. So it did a, some logic, and uh, the whole process only takes about 60 microseconds. And if you remember, it's a one megahertz CPU, and it leaves like 40 microseconds uh, for the processing. It means it's actually 40 clock cycles. Um, and I guess if people would look at this, they might even come up with a faster assembler code. But that's a, a reasonable time, and we were surprised in the end how, how fast we could actually um, sample signals. Um, before we go back to, to another demo, just um, a few lessons I learned. I don't know how many people in this room have built hardware, probably you know, a few. Uh, I, I'm a physicist, I did simulations most of my time before I started doing this, so I didn't build hardware, and then I set out to build hardware for a machine that is older than me. So how would you do that? You actually start uh, reading actual books. So there's, uh, there's some manuals online, but the best thing I did for this project was to go on a bookstore and you know, buy old books. They, they're actually cheap, and they describe a lot of things that happen in this Apple II, uh, and also general things about electronics. And then you have to design some things, and you have to try, and you have to repeat. And the best thing I, I figured out was when I um, build a breadboard that doesn't work, this is the breadboard where I set up the, the ADC card. Um, when it doesn't work, the best is just take a new one and, and start again. And then, you know, probably it works then, and you have better ideas, or you're more awake because it's the next day. And last, uh, for this, uh, it's important and it keeps you motivated to choose a real-world problem. And this could be anything from you know, changing the heat or turning on and off the light in your room, uh, watering plants, you know, having a Apollo guidance system fly to the moon, or getting rid of nuclear weapons. And uh, one of the benefits of working on getting rid of nuclear weapons, it's not a benefit, actually it's a you know, disadvantage. The last year was bad. And there were many sleepless nights worrying about what Trump and Kim Jong-un might do. So when I couldn't sleep, I could actually at least work on something that might be useful. And if you want to try this uh, for yourself, um, the software for the Apple II is online. There's also a repository for the hardware. And if you don't happen to hap have an Apple II, which is probably likely, uh, there's also a repository which has an emulator for the Apple II. Uh, where I added um, special emulation for the cards we built. So you can actually test out the software loading the disk that we did just on your normal Linux computer. And now we go back to another demo. Can we uh, switch back to the... Uh, here we go. Okay. So here's our template. Um, so we could either now inspect the valid item and not touch anything, or if we had a second uh, item, we, um, a second source, we could, you know, kind of try and inspect the fake weapon. Um, let me see. Let's do uh, an inspection here. I'm not, I haven't touched um, the source. Uh, if you watched me in the meantime, uh, I actually acquired a second template, uh, kind of you know, doing it again, hoping that uh, the, the high voltage um, uh, did stabilize in, in the meantime. Um, so we're now inspecting. We haven't changed the warhead, so to speak. So we hope it'll pass, but I can't promise. Um, do we have uh, a second radioactive source in the audience? Let me see. Um, here, here we go, yes. We, the, we, uh, we were, um, one of our friends was kind enough to uh, bring uh, one along. Uh, I can tell you international air travel with radioactive sources, not recommended. Uh, so we tried to find them in, uh, in Germany. Uh, they are, of course, completely harmless. Yeah? So let's just wait until uh, this one finishes. 
I can tell you when, uh, when you start calling your friends, uh, you know, look, I, I need a radioactive, radioactive source, I want to take it to Leipzig, to the Congress, people tell you, look, you know, I'm sorry, I can't help you with that. <laughs> um, but some do. Um, yeah, so thanks for that. So here we go. Again, the code, actually, most of the, uh, the, uh, the software does the display, which wouldn't be in the, in the final version of the software, so to speak. Right now, uh, how many bytes do we have? 2,000? It's, it's two and a half kilobytes, but most of this is the display strings you see and the, the code that actually displays stuff. OK. And um, now comes the. So let me put the check. OK. Pass. Uh, chi square statistic uh, hex 12, uh, which we'll see uh, that's actually pretty good. Um, so now I have the second source. Uh, let me just throw it, uh, you know, somewhere on the table. And um, let's run another inspection. I hit the three. And um, well, you can actually, I guess, if you watch the previous one uh, carefully, you, you can already see there's a new peak, uh, you know, showing up on the left. Uh, side, so you know, it really should fail by that uh, by now. Do you have anything to add in the meantime while we're waiting? I think we can, you know, do the the announcement basically. If you if you after this talk, there will be other talks, so we have to leave the stage quickly. But if you want to have a closer look at the device, uh, we're going over to the CCCL, and we will be at the the Forum Informatikerin für den Frieden. Uh, area, which is on the first level, I think. And we just set it up there. So if you want to have a closer look at this, uh, you, you're invited to come over and uh, see. Um, we might not bring the, the sources just for security. You know, just bring the device. and uh. Just one thing, you know, in case I forget it at the very end. I mean, uh, you know, I'll wrap up in a moment. Um, uh, but the one thing I think that we def did definitely show with this, uh, you know, um, is you, the one megahertz processor is actually, you know, fast enough to do this right. I mean, we get about 2,000 counts per second, uh, which is actually not a bad number to, for this type of application. And that's, uh, you know, that's um, a one megahertz chip is just enough. So here we go. Uh, it's complete. I hit uh, the check. And uh, it failed. Uh, and if you see, the, the hex score here is pretty, pretty significant. More it's the machine language coding here. OK, uh, can we switch back to the, um, the main screen? OK, uh, so I had, I could very briefly in just a, a, a two or three uh, slides explain what the code is actually doing, uh, which is actually the beauty of, of the template approach. And it's, by, it's inspired by Tris. Uh, so here's a real-world spectrum, um, uh, you know, looking a little fancier than the ones you just saw, but basically the same thing. Uh, imagine uh, yellow is a valid item and orange is the invalid item. Uh, here we have, and you see there's one area where they're kind of different, um, but otherwise they look, you know, pretty similar. Uh, the first thing we do is we divide it up into a number of bins, a uh, small number. We pick 12, but, you know, there's nothing special about uh, 12, uh, small number. Uh, and then we take the average count uh, in these bins, so it's a very, very low resolution spectrum or histogram, if you will, of, of, this, uh, of this radiation spectrum. And then we just uh, compare uh, yellow versus orange and uh, take the chi-square uh, statistic for, you know, 12 or 11 uh, degrees uh, of freedom. And the nice thing is, that, you know, you see the equation up there, uh, you know, you need to subtract two numbers, uh, multiply the difference, and divide by, you know, another number, and you do this 12 times. Even in machine language, uh, you know, it's pretty straightforward and easy to implement. Uh, and uh, when you do this for, for this particular example, um, you get for a valid item um, a chi-square of around 10, and you see, you know, distribution. You then, uh, you know, define, okay, what is green, what is red, pass and fail. And if you take the orange one, which, you know, wasn't quite, uh, it wasn't very different, but in terms of the chi-square, it, you know, it looks drastically different. Uh, so, and you're done. You have a pass-fail uh, algorithm. Uh, pretty simple. So, wrapping up, you know, where do we go from here? Uh, you know, can we, can we actually turn this into a viable uh, device for trusted uh, measurements? You know, maybe uh, with the help of this community uh, here. So there's a bunch of things, obviously, that we would have to do, you know, revising the software and the hardware, clean up the code. There's a few things that we actually haven't done yet, subtract the background, uh, you know, correct for detector drift, uh, and so on, uh, replace the high voltage module, you know, pretty straightforward. We also probably want to uh, package uh, the board um, or the whole equipment in, uh, you know, some uh, type of serious enclosure. 
so that it's robust against uh, you know, tempest attacks uh, and, and so on. But the one thing that is probably the most important one, everything kind of hinges on, on that particular one for this particular idea is, you know, can we actually prove uh, that the, uh, the processor in this Apple II, uh, the 6502, is authentic, it's genuine. Uh, this one is actually was pulled from the Tempest machine that you saw earlier on, on the picture. But can we prove that the processor is, you know, uh, is uh, the real deal? Um, because if we can't, then we haven't really, uh, you know, uh, won a lot. Uh, so the Apple II board, you know, uh, Wozniak's masterpiece, uh, Moritz showed it already. People have done amazing uh, things with the 6502, uh, you know, the visual 6502.org uh, have done these uh, very high resolution optical uh, images of the, uh, of the die, uh, built a transistor level simulation of the 6502. Uh, it's kind of destructive analysis. What we hope uh, we'll be able to do is, or we ask, uh, can we do this in a non-destructive way? Uh, not the simulation, but the imaging uh, of the chip so that you can actually confirm the architecture, the original ar architecture of, of the chip. You know, because we want to use the chip afterwards, uh, obviously. And we hope we can take, take advantage of the fact that the, uh, uh, the, the chip is pro uh, made with you know, 8 micron uh, technology. It's huge. Uh, compared to what we use today, it only has 3,500 uh, transistor, and it's very, very well understood. Um, we think there may be, uh, you know, several options uh, to do this. Uh, I mentioned the high-resolution X-ray microscopy. You know, ideally, you know, if we could age date the chip, uh, you know, or the package of the chip uh, using some forensic techniques, uh, that would be fantastic proof of provenance of, of the chip. Or perhaps even some, you know, logic testing uh, to confirm the original architecture of the chip. Again, uh, we hope we can, you know, leverage in some way the deep understanding of the 6502, you know, at the, uh, the transistor level uh, for, this, uh, for this purpose. Uh, I think that's all uh, we have. Um, uh, we uh, posted everything on uh, vintageverification.org, uh, the slides, uh, the code, uh, the hardware, um, the hardware uh, designs, and as Moritz mentioned, uh, will be outside if you're interested and, you know, demo the hardware. And with that, I guess we're happy uh, to take questions. Okay, so we have some time for questions. So please come closer to the microphones, raise your hand. And we'll take the first one from the mic number five. Hi, great talk. Um, one question. Um, you said that you need to verify uh, the chip that's um, authentic. Can you not do this afterwards, after you use the chip for the measurement? And do the destructive uh, analysis afterwards? Uh, it's a good question. My, I think my answer would be uh, probably not, and uh, because the damage would be already done in a, in a way. That's also why you know uh, cut and choose approaches, where you put ten on the table and you know just pick one and inspect the others at home, may not be good enough for this type of application. You know, the your your you know the other side would say, look, this, the risk is you know after the fact you learned already our weapon design, uh, and uh, it's kind of too late. So ideally, we really want to do it. Uh, before we actually use it for the inspection. Okay, thank you. Now, uh, number one, please. Oh, there was three. Hi, uh, thank you for the talk. Um, my question was about the, um, you, you had stated that um, you were concerned about side channel potentially leaking some information about like the spectra or what you were processing over, and I was kind of wondering um, how you would address that with a 6502 CPU. That's probably the question we, we feared from the audience. We, we, we basically, we, we haven't thought of this in detail. And, and of course, you would have many side channels in the 6502. Um, but at least that's my you know, layman assumption is that if you can, can run it from a battery in, a, in an enclosure that is RF resistant enough, uh, that the system would be simple enough that people would know all the flaws and then protect against all the, the ways you could actually get into the, the system. Um, whereas if you would take a modern chip, even if it's a simple chip, you know, that's, that's many of the talks, you always find out afterwards that actually there's a way to, to listen into what the chip is doing. Um, with the 6502, people have tried to do this for 40 years. We think this uh, makes it secure than, not a full proof, of course, but it makes it secure than, than a new chip. 
Uh, let's go to microphone number three. Um, a great talk with great toys. Um, I mean, what you, what you did is you uh, made gamma spectroscopy uh, available with uh, much uh, lower, uh, cheaper, simpler equipment than other people. Uh, do you also have an idea where to get uh, cesium, oh, um, sodium iodide uh, scintillator material so that uh, you could do different uh, spectroscopy applications at home? Uh, you can actually order sodium iodide crystals on eBay or online, and they're freely available to everyone who wants them, and they're not even expensive. And you can get the whole set of uh, crystal with the photomultiplier, which needs to be uh, light, uh, has to be blocked out. So this is why it's silver shiny, so all the light that is inside stays inside, and no light from outside hits the photocathode. You can buy these things actually in old on eBay for, for you know a couple of a couple of, you know, 10, 20, 100, depending on where you get this from, dollars or euros. Is that also, does that also apply to rat-poisoned uh, cesium iodide? Um, tallium, tallium doped. Uh, I guess probably not. I haven't checked. No, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't know. But th this detector... I mean, this is why we like these detectors. Yeah. I mean, they're really, there's nothing more abundant than uh, yeah, that this type of detector. You, you, know, you, can, you can find them on eBay, and they're really uh, affordable. Thank you. More questions? Step up to the microphones. And microphone three. Thank you. Um, have you gotten in touch with Woz at all, or have you wanted to, or needed to? <laughs> you mean with uh, Steve Wozniak? Yeah. Uh, not yet, maybe after this talk. I mean, uh, literally, if you knew when we finished this uh, project, uh, you'd be, you know, kind of just a few hours ago, so to speak. Uh, but now we have something that actually works, and uh, I'm not actually sure what we would ask him, but I uh, hope you'll like it. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> okay. More questions? We still have a little bit of time. Maybe for one more question. We can run more inspections if you want, huh? <laughs> okay, good. Someone's coming up. Microphone one. So thank you very much for the talk. Maybe a very naive question. Um, but what is secret on the spectrum? What can you learn from a spectrum? It's not the receipt of Coca-Cola, I guess. Um, yeah, I have to go back to all the way to the beginning. Um, but, you know, I mean, you could make the argument, and I think it's a, it's a valid one. I mean, it's something, especially from a non-weapon seed, you, you should ask, you know, I mean, you know, what's the, what's the big deal about your secret, you know? It would be so much easier, and that's, that's a true statement, an obvious statement. If you revealed the secret, then, you know, you wouldn't have to protect it. Uh, and, you know, it's, it's always worth asking, you know, what exactly do we have to protect? Um, we, um, you know, a kind of a middle ground here is we believe that these 12 numbers, uh, they may be just on the edge uh, where uh, a weapon state might say, look, you know what, these 12 numbers for the, you know, the template for this particular weapon type, we might as well put them out there. Uh, and you know, we don't have to protect the template. That would be a, a, a big deal. But in general, the idea or the, um, uh, the concern, concern would be that you, as, you can actually learn, uh, you know, more or less the design of that particular weapon. And, you know, they, they are weapons, so, you know, people try to defend against them. Uh, so, uh, um, you know, the, your adversary might uh, learn exactly, you know, how you designed your weapon and uh, may actually come up with an, an idea to defeat it. And, um, again, I'm not subscribing to this, uh, you know, viewpoint, but, you know, that's obviously something that people would bring up. And, you know, uh, weapon states have invested billions and, uh, of dollars into this technology and... Um, because they think they need it and they will protect the, the secret. Uh, but the question about revealing the secret is a very important one. Uh, and, you know, we shouldn't just take it at face value. Yes, you know, we, we have to protect, you know, every secret that you say is a secret. Uh, and I think the argument, if, if you actually give us, you know, if you're being more transparent about certain things, uh, the verification part gets so much easier and maybe less intrusive and it could be a win-win uh, at the end of the day. But, of course, the recipe for Coca-Cola would also be pretty important. Sorry? <laughs> Never mind. Uh, okay. <laughs> okay, that was the last question. We are out of time, unfortunately. But give a huge round of applause to Moritz and Alex. Alex and Moritz from Princeton University. Getting rid of nuclear weapons. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you.